Welcome to the Cloisters Talks on the New Employment Tribunal Rules of 2013. My name is Declan A. Dempsey, I'm a barrister at Cloisters Chambers, and this talk is designed not to give legal advice, but to point litigants in person to uh, sources of information within the Employment Tribunal Rules for when you're conducting uh, cases on your own. The first thing I think you need to come to grips with in this new set of rules is the uh, overriding objective, and you'll find this in Rule 2. Read the text. It's an important aid to the interpretation of the rules. It gives you the overriding uh, objective, their aim. It's an important guide to conduct in the tribunals as well. So what does it consist in? If you have a copy of the rules, which I'd urge you to find on the internet by putting in a search string such as Employment Tribunal Rules uh, 2013, then you'll see the rule deals with um, the overriding objective, which is to deal with cases fairly and justly, with a fairly bland general aim. But it does receive some more articulation in the rule itself, it means that the parties before the tribunal should be on an equal footing, and that means, in turn, that if you're unrepresented and you're up against uh, an experienced lawyer, you shouldn't be prejudiced in terms of your ability to put your case forward. It doesn't mean that the tribunal will favour your case, but it does mean that they should make sure that you're not prejudiced by the fact that you're unrepresented. Secondly, it means that the management of cases must be proportionate to the complexity and the importance of the issues involved. So whenever you're thinking about trying to persuade the tribunal to do something, bear that point in mind. You don't take a sledgehammer to crack a nut. And being proportionate to the complexity of the case is very important. Also, the importance of the issues, that doesn't mean how important they are to you personally, but objectively how important those issues are. We're going to come on to what an issue is in an employment tribunal case uh, later on in this series. But for the moment, bear in mind that it's the issues of fact and law that the tribunal is going to have to determine. The tribunal also will seek to avoid unnecessary formality it will try to be flexible in its proceedings and avoid delay. One other aspect of the overriding objective is to save expense. You must assist the tribunal to achieve and cooperate with the other parties to achieve the same. In this talk I'm going to talk about how you start a claim. The material you'll need is set out in Rule 8. You have to use the prescribed form and observe any practice directions that apply. For these, you should go and have a look at the Employment Tribunal's website. Have a look at Rule 8.2 for when a claim can be presented in uh, England or Wales, and 8.3 for when a claim can be presented in Scotland. These are important rules relating to jurisdiction. You should try and help the tribunal to see how your argument hangs together. And one good way of doing it is by creating a timeline and in that timeline setting out as neutrally as you can the facts which you say occurred. This will enable you later on to build up the evidence that you need and also will help the tribunal immediately to see that there is an arguable complaint, which is something that they'll be looking at later on. But before we turn to that, I want to deal with the situation of multiple claimants. Rule 9 says that if claimant number 1 and claimant number 2 have claims based on the same set of facts, they may make their claims on the same claim form. However, if they use the same form but their claims aren't based on the same set of facts, that's an irregularity. Well, that means that the tribunal can waive it, strike 
about the claim form or part of it, bar the claimant from participating, or award costs, as in other irregularities under Rule 6. I want to look at the rules relating to rejection of claims. These are in Rule 10 through to 12. The Employment Tribunal must reject the claim if it's not on the prescribed form or if it doesn't have each claimant's name and address and each respondent's name and address. That's Rule 10. It must also reject the claim if it's not accompanied by the fee or remission application. See Rule 11. The judge on reference from the Employment Tribunal staff considers whether or not there is jurisdiction to hear the matters set out in the complaint and whether or not the claim form is an abuse of process or whether it cannot sensibly be responded to. That's in Rule 12. What happens if you don't send the right fee? I'm going to talk about fees later on. But if the fee paid is less than it ought to be, the tribunal it gives notice of the date by which the full fee should be paid. Uh, failure to do that means the claim or part of it in respect of which the full fee hasn't been paid will be rejected by the Employment Tribunal. If an application to remit the fee fails wholly or in part, the Tribunal will send the claimant notice specifying the date for payment of the tribunal fee. The claim is rejected if the fee is not paid by that date. The form is returned to the claimant on rejection with notice of rejection explaining why it was rejected. The rules are in Rule 10.2, 11.4 and 12.3 which also refers to the need for the judge to give reasons. The notice contains information about how to apply for reconsideration. That's in Rule 10.2 and 12.3. But no such information is provided if the fee was absent. If the claimant applies in writing, giving reasons why the rejection was wrong and or rectifying the defect, then the tribunal can reconsider the rejection. If the claimant wants a hearing, the written application must ask for it. And if a hearing happens, uh, only the claimant need attend. If the claimant doesn't seek a hearing or the judge accepts that the claim uh, should be accepted in full, then the judge determines the application without a hearing. That's Rule 13. However, if the judge decides that the original rejection was correct, but the defect has been rectified, the claim form is treated as presented on the date that the defect was rectified and that rule which will fix time for presentation of the claim it is in Rule 13.4. Special rules apply to whistleblowing cases. If a claim form alleges that the claimant made a protected disclosure and the claimant consents, then under Rule 14, the Tribunal can send a copy of the claim form to any of the regulators under the Public Interest Disclosure Prescribed, Act, Prescribed Persons Order of 1999. So that's what can happen to the claim form. Let's now have a look at the process of responding. The place to look is Rule 15. The Employment Tribunal will send the claim form to the respondent with notice of whether or any part of it is rejected and the prescribed response form on which any response must be made. The notice gives the time for responding uh, as within 28 days of being sent uh, the claim form by the uh, Employment Tribunal. Have a look at Rule 16. Rule 16 says that respondents may use the same response form if they are resisting on the same grounds or if they are saying that they do not intend to resist the claim. 
the respondent may resist multiple claims based on the same facts using one claim uh, response form. By Rule 17, the response form will be rejected if it is not on the prescribed form or if it lacks the respondent's full name and address and an indication of whether the respondent wants to dispute all or part of the claim. Where a response form is rejected, a notice is sent explaining why it was rejected and explaining the respondent's potential course of action, which is to apply for an extension of time. It also tells them how to apply for reconsideration. These are set out in Rules 17 and 18. The reasons why a response form might be rejected are firstly Rule 17, that the correct form wasn't used, or Rule 18, that it was presented late. Any application for an extension must either of time must either precede the presentation of the response form or accompany it. Let's look at that point in a little more detail now. If the response form is received outside the time limit in Rule 16 or any extension of that limit which has been granted within the original limit, then Unless either an application for an extension has already been made under Rule 20 or the response includes or is accompanied by one, uh, then the form will be received uh, out of time. Where there is a application for an extension accompanying the response form, the response is not rejected pending the outcome of the application. Suppose that the response form is rejected, it's returned to the respondent together with a rejection notice. This explains that it's been presented late and how the respondent can apply for an extension of time and also how to apply for reconsideration. The basis for reconsideration is that the decision to reject the response form was wrong or that the notified defect, the defect that's been notified under Rule 17, can be rectified. A respondent can apply in writing for a reconsideration and present that application to the Employment Tribunal within 14 days of the date the rejection notice was sent. The application must explain why the decision was wrong or the defect can be cured, and it may, must state whether the respondent wants a hearing. If the respondent doesn't state this, the judge decides the application without one. Uh, the judge may also do this if the, the judge decides that the response form should be accepted in full. An application to extend time for presenting a response under Rule 20 must be a written application and a copy must be sent to the claimant explaining why the extension is sought. However, if the time has already expired, the application must have a draft response that the respondent wishes to present or an explanation why that is not possible. If the respondent wants a hearing of the application, the application must state that as well. The claimant, within seven days of receipt of the application, may give written reasons why the application is, is opposed. The judge decides this and can do so without uh, a hearing whether or not one is sought. Let's turn next to the effects of a failure to accept a response form. Have a look at Rule 21 for this and the trigger points in particular in Rule 21.1. What happens then is that the judge decides whether on the available material, which may include further information which the parties are required to, by the judge to provide, a determination can properly be made of the claim or part of it. If it can, the judge issues a judgment accordingly. Otherwise, the hearing, there is a hearing fixed before a judge sitting alone and the judge has a discretion to permit the respondent 
to participate thereafter. Suppose that the response is accepted. Under Rule 22, it's then sent to all the parties. And that's the standard approach in those two types of cases. There's one other type of case that we need to consider, which is the employer's contract claim. This is dealt with under Rules 23 through to 25. You can only make an employer's contract claim as part of a response form, which is itself responding to a claim which includes an employee's contract claim. It's treated as a claim, so Rules 12 and 13 apply, and the employer's contract claim is notified to the claimant. That notice says how to send a response, deals with the time limit and the consequences of default. These are all set out in Rule 24. The employee has to respond to the employer's contract claim within 28 days of the date that it was sent to them. This is all set out in Rule 20 and 21, which also deals with the default position. Turning next to what happens after the claim and response have been processed, there is then a new phase in the Employment Tribunal rules under Rules 26 to 28. The judge considers all the documents and asks whether there are arguable complaints which are within the jurisdiction of the Employment Tribunal, and similarly whether there are any arguable defences within the jurisdiction of the Tribunal. The judge can order either of the parties to provide further information in order to allow the judge to make that determination. The judge can make a case management order listing uh, or a preliminary or a final hearing and proposing judicial mediation or other dispute resolution. I want to talk a little bit now about the dismissal of a claim or a response. Have a look if you're a claimant at Rule 27 and if you're a respondent, Rule 28. So if the judge considers either that the Employment Tribunal doesn't have any jurisdiction, this applies to the claimant only, or that there's no reasonable prospect of success, either of the defence or of the claim, then action can be taken in respect of all or part of the claim or response. What happens is that the judge sends written notice to the parties giving reasons for the conclusion that's been reached. If the judge considers on the SIFT that either the Employment Tribunal has no jurisdiction over the claimant's claim, or in respect of the claim or the response, that there's no reasonable prospect of success for all or part of it, the judge will then send a written notice to the parties giving the reasons for that conclusion. It'll also give the date on which the claimant or respondent's claim form or response form or part of it is dismissed unless before that date the claimant or respondent presents written reasons why that should not occur, why the document shouldn't be dismissed. If no such reasons are received then dismissal takes effect without more and the response is treated as if it's never been presented with the consequences in Rule 21. If reasons are received, the judge may permit the claim form or response or part of it to proceed or fix a date for the hearing of that point, whether the claim or response or part of it should proceed. The claimant or respondent may attend that hearing and participate if they want, but they're not obliged to. If any party is permitted to proceed, then a case management order is made. Now, 
Case management orders are very important powers of the tribunal and you'll find the general judicial power under Rule 29. A case management order in particular may vary, suspend or set aside an earlier case management order where that's necessary in the interests of justice. And in particular, where a party affected by the earlier order didn't have a reasonable opportunity to make representations before it was made. It's in this context that practice directions issued by the President under Regulation 11 um, about the exercise of the powers under the rules which I talked about earlier will be particularly important. In relation to case management orders, if you want the tribunal to make an order, it's best in my view to apply sooner rather than later and don't uh, wait around for tactical reasons because as a litigant in person it's much better for you to get the issues defined early on so that you can work to those issues and also to get the information that you need out of the respondent uh, or in turn if they're seeking information from you to get that information to them. So have a look at rule 30 what the rules say is that a, a, an application for a case management order may be made either at a hearing or it can be presented in writing to the employment tribunal. But if the application is in writing, you've got to notify the other parties that any objections to the application should be sent to the employment tribunal as soon as possible. The employment tribunal may deal with it in writing or order that it be dealt with at a preliminary or final hearing. The use of the term as soon as possible emphasises the need for speed in responding with your objections. Remember that you've got a duty to um, further the overriding objective under the rules and therefore again don't wait till the last possible minute because that clearly won't be as soon as possible. I want to talk a little bit about disclosure of documents and I'll say more about disclosure of documents in a future talk but Rule 31 deals with disclosure of documents. The rule is that the Employment Tribunal can order any person in Great Britain to disclose documents or information to a party by providing copies or otherwise or um, they can allow a party to inspect that kind of material and these types of material are the types that could be ordered by a county court or in Scotland by a sheriff. So note that the rules allow for disclosure of information so it doesn't have to be a tangible document. Secondly note that it's such disclosure as might be ordered by a county court or in Scotland by a sheriff the principles of Rule 31 of the Civil Procedure Rules, these are the rules that govern the High Court and County Court and the Sheriff in Scotland, um, deals with disclosure in that context. Now Rule 31 states that disclosure means stating that a document exists or has existed. That's Rule 31.2. Disclosure is the item has to be necessary for the fair disposal of the case and openness. And in the civil courts, a process of what's known as standard disclosure has arisen. Standard disclosure requires parties to disclose only those documents which are or have been in their control and which satisfy the following criteria. So they're going to be information or a document on which the party relies or which adversely affects or supports either their own uh, case or another party's case, or which they're required to disclose by a practice direction. The CPR, that's the Civil Procedure Rules 31.6 and 31.8 deal with this. What the Civil Procedure Rules require is a reasonable search for those first two types uh, of document Increasingly, however, you're going to have to be able to make representations about electronic documents 
and there is quite a complicated process in the High Court and in the County Court for electronic uh, disclosure. This has to deal with the large amounts of information that the disclosure of material on an electronic database might disclose. So in a later talk I'll deal with electronic disclosure. The other point to note is about disclosure of documents is that the duty continues to the end of the proceedings. Each party must notify the other if relevant documents come to their attention before the end of the process. And this is why you may find yourself receiving documents from a lawyer on the other side who, in accordance with their duty to make disclosure, which is a continuing one, produces a document to you, and it may be a document that helps your case or hinders it, uh, and equally it may be a document that helps or hinders their own case. But that's what's going on when they uh, produce those documents. The rule is that you should notify um, the other side really as soon as relevant documents come to your attention uh, before the end of the process. Now something else that very often worries uh, litigants and particularly employers is the use that um, the other side can make of the documents that have been disclosed. It's very important to know that unless a document has been read to or by the court at a public hearing, or the court or tribunal gives permission, or the discloser and the owner of the document agree otherwise, then the party to whom disclosure is made can only use the document for the purposes of the proceeding in which it's been disclosed. Moreover, the court can order um, further restrictions on the use of the documents. They can order, make orders restricting or prohibiting further use of the documents. That's CPR 3122.2. Well, as I say, I'm going to leave that topic there because we'll talk about disclosure in a future talk. Instead, what I want to do is turn to witness orders now under Rules 32 and 33. The Tribunal's got a power to order any person in Great Britain to attend a hearing to give evidence or to produce documents or to produce information. So it's a very extensive power and it's not simply a question of uh, evidence giving. It could be to produce documents or it could be to produce information. There's a separate procedure for taking evidence in other EU member states. It doesn't apply in Denmark. Um, if the court of a state, in accordance with the provisions of the law of that state, requests, then the um, competent court of another member state can take evidence, or it can make the request to take the evidence directly itself in the other member state. Now, if you have a situation in which this may crop up, there's an EC regulation 1026 stroke 2001, and that sets out in detail the procedure that's to be followed. So you can take the tribunal to that and invite them to apply that procedure. Next, I want to talk about parties and um, substituting uh, parties and also interested parties. The materials on this you can find at Rule 34 and 35. The general rule is that um, the Employment Tribunal can on its own initiative or on application of a party or any other person who wants to become a party, add a person as a party by way of substitution or otherwise. However, it's got to appear that there are issues between that person and any of the existing parties falling within the jurisdiction of the Tribunal and the tribunal has to conclude that it's in the interests of justice to have those issues determined in the proceedings. The tribunal can also remove any party that apparently has wrongly been included. One other interesting power that the tribunal has is that it can allow any person to participate in proceedings on terms that may be specified. In respect of any matter, in which that person has a legitimate interest. One of the things that will need to be worked out is what a legitimate interest means in this situation. But it could mean, for example, that a trade organisation 
uh, would want to make representations, if the tribunal was going to be interpreting a contract which is common to all employment within that trade, and equally a union might want to make representations in a case where collective bargaining issues are at stake. I want to turn next to striking out. Rule 37 deals with this. And a tribunal can, at any time, on its own initiative, or after somebody's made an application, strike out all or part of a claim or response. The grounds for striking uh, out are as follows. One, that it's scandalous or vexatious, or that it has no reasonable prospect of success. Two, that the manner in which the proceedings have been conducted by or on behalf of the claimant or respondent, as the case may be, has been scandalous unreasonable or vexatious. Third, you can get struck out for non-compliance with any of the rules or with an order of the employment tribunal. Fourth, striking out can occur if the claim has not been actively pursued. Fifth, if the tribunal considers that it's no longer possible to have a fair trial in respect of the claim or response or the part to be struck out, then striking out can occur. However, in all of these cases, there's got to be a reasonable opportunity to make representations, either in writing or if requested by the party who is on the receiving end of the strikeout, at a hearing. In the case of a response, if it's struck out, it's as if it had never been presented, and the consequences under Rule 21 apply. I want to turn now to two draconian powers that the tribunal has. The first is the unless order, and the second is the deposit order. Looking at the unless order, this is dealt with under Rule 38. If you're on the receiving end of an unless order, take it very seriously, because it does what it says. So, an order can specify that if it's not complied with by the date specified in the uh, um, order, then the claim or response, or part of it, shall be dismissed without further order. In other words, it's automatic. The tribunal gives written notice to the parties, but that's just to confirm dismissal. The dismissal itself occurs if the action which you were ordered to do is not done by the date specified. The tribunal will notify that you have 14 days within which to uh, apply to set aside the um, dismissal of the claim or response. So you can apply, in other words, for a set aside within 14 days of the notice being sent. Now there's only one ground. The tribunal has to be convinced that it's in the interest of justice to set the dismissal aside. Unless you ask for a hearing on that point, the tribunal de determines it on the written representations. A dismissed response is once again treated as if never presented, and you can see the consequences under Rule 21. So an unless order is a very extreme order for the tribunal to make, and it'll generally be made where there has been previous default on ordinary orders, so the tribunal has to get tough with the defaulting party. But it's not confined to that. There may be some situations in which it's just appropriate to make an unless order because of the importance of the issue that needs to be uh, dealt with, uh, or the uh, time that the case is taking, for example. Turning next to deposit orders, these are dealt with under Rule 39, which clarifies how the tribunals used to treat these matters. First of all, there's got to be a preliminary hearing on whether a deposit order should be made, and the tribunal has to consider specific allegations or arguments. Now, I'm going to refer to those as a point, but they could be factual allegations, specific ones, or specific legal arguments, for example. 
in order to reach the conclusion that a deposit order should be made, the tribunal has to consider that the point has little prospect of success. And it has a power to order a deposit of up to £1,000 as a condition of pursuing that point, so that factual allegation or the legal argument. What this means is that different deposits of a thousand, of up to a thousand pounds, can be required in relation to different points. The tribunal is obliged to make reasonable inquiries into the ability to pay the deposit, and they must have regard to that information that they derive from that inquiry uh, when ordering the amount to be paid. The order for a deposit has consequences. The way it works is this. The notice of the order gives the reasons for the order. So with the order, you should get the reasons for it and also a notice of the potential consequences of the order. There are two consequences that you need to watch out for. If you fail to pay by the specified day, the point, so the allegation, the argument, is struck out. And if it's a response, it has the uh, Rule 21 consequences. If you decide to go ahead having paid the deposit, and the tribunal hearing the case ultimately decides the point, to which the deposit order relates, for substantially the same reasons as those set out in the deposit order, then first of all, the conduct in pursuing the point is deemed to be unreasonable for the purposes of whether or not a costs order should be made or a preparation time order should be made, unless you can show that to the contrary it wasn't uh, unreasonable uh, to pursue the point. The second consequence is this, that the deposit is paid to the other party or parties and it can be set off against any costs or preparation time orders that might be made at that point. Otherwise the deposit is going to be refunded I want to talk about non-payment of fees, which are dealt with under Rule 40. There are two defined terms here, tribunal fee and remission application, and we'll come on to the definitions of those in a minute. But where a party hasn't paid a relevant tribunal fee or presented a remission application in respect of that fee, the Employment Tribunal sends a notice specifying the date for the payment of the tribunal fee or presentation of a remission application. If it's not paid or if there's no remission application made at a specified uh, date, then claims, employer contract claims and applications are dismissed without further order and judicial mediation does not take place. Rule 1 deals with definitions and in particular it defines tribunal fee. This means any fee which is payable by a party under any enactment in respect of a claim, employer's contract claim, application or judicial mediation in an employment tribunal. Now the enactment involved is the uh, law dealing with the payment of tribunal fees and we'll come on to the amounts uh, later on. A remission application is also defined and it means any application which can be made under any enactment for the remission or part remission of a tribunal fee. I want to turn to remission applications. This is dealt with under Rule 40 and if a remission application is refused in full or in part then the tribunal sends out a notice specifying a date for the payment of the tribunal fee. If it's not paid at that date, the dismissal consequences that we've discussed 
uh, um, earlier can occur. The disappointed party can apply for the claim or response or part of it which was dismissed to be reinstated in those circumstances. The tribunal may order a reinstatement, but it's only effective if the tribunal fee is paid or a remission application is presented and accepted by the date specified in the order. I want to say something about delivery of documents under the rules. Rule 85 deals with the general position. You can deliver to the employment tribunal by post direct delivery including courier or messenger to the appropriate tribunal office or by electronic communication. However, there's going to be a practice direction accompanying Rule 8 and a claim form can only be delivered in accordance with that practice direction. So when you're filling out the claim form, look on the website to find the practice direction and read up what you have to do. The Employment Tribunal notifies the address of the Employment Tribunal office dealing with the claim and all documents are to be delivered to that office. The Employment Tribunal can stipulate that some modes of uh, communication are not to be used. So, for example, they might ban the use of um, email, for example. Let's look at delivery to the parties. This is dealt with under Rule 86, and it can be by post, by direct delivery to the party's address, including delivery by courier or messenger service, by electronic communication, or by being handed personally to the party if it, the party is an individual and if no representative has been named in the claim form or response. It can also be given handed personally to any individual representative named in the claim form or response. Or, on the occasion of a hearing, it can be handed to any person identified by the party as representing them at that hearing. Post, whether direct or electronic, it must be delivered to the address of the representative identified in the claim form or response, or such other address as the party has notified to the tribunal in writing. Postal or any electronic communication is equally good, unless the party has indicated in writing that a particular address must not be used. Occasionally there will need to be delivery to non-parties and Rule 87 takes care of this. The rule is that there can be delivery to the address notified by the non-party or any known address or place of business in the UK or registered office in the UK or with the President's permission at an address outside the UK. There are special rules that apply to service uh, on the Secretary of State, Law Officers and Council General. If there's no address using these rules, the President, Vice President or, re or Regional Employment Judge can allow substituted service. When is a communication received? Well, Rule 90 deals with this. And the general rule is that unless the contrary is proved, it's taken to have been received by the addressee First, if it was sent by post on the day on which it would be delivered in the ordinary course of post. Second, if sent by means of electronic communication on the day of the transmission. Third, if delivered directly or personally on the day of delivery. However, if the tribunal is satisfied that the document or its substance uh, has in fact come to the attention of the person, then they can, in any event, treat it as delivered, and that's Rule 91. Rule 92 deals with correspondence. Where a party sends a communication to the Employment Tribunal, accepts an application for a witness order, that's under Rule 32, the Employment Tribunal must send a copy to all other parties and state that it has done so. It can use the CC mechanism, or it can use some other mechanism. The tribunal can also order a departure from this rule when it considers it to be in the interests of justice to do so. I 
I want next to talk about group litigation. Rule 36 deals with these multi-handed cases and the process that's evolved over the years is that where you have a number of claims that have got common or related issues of law or fact, they tend to be administered by an empl one employment tribunal or the president um, and one or more cases will be ordered to be lead cases. The other related cases in the related issues group or common issues group will be stayed or in Scotland sisted. What that means is that action on them will be suspended, nothing else will happen on them until the stay or cyst is lifted. So that process has been formalised under Rule 36 and within 28 days of the Employment Tribunal decision sent, being sent to the parties, a claimant who's in the related issues group, so whose proceedings have been stayed or assisted, may apply in writing for an order that it doesn't apply to a particular related case. So in other words, that their case shouldn't be stayed. What happens if the lead case is withdrawn before the common or related issue is decided? Well, in those circumstances, the tribunal must order um, and decide whether another case is to lead and whether any order affecting the related cases, for example a stay or cyst, should be lifted or set aside or should otherwise be varied. So it is possible to substitute another lead case. Rule 7 deals with presidential guidance. Now this is guidance which deals with matters of practice and as to how the powers conferred by the rules may be exercised. However, although tribunals must have regard to such guidance, they're not bound by it and a tribunal may lawfully fail to comply with the guidance provided it's considered it. It must consider any guidance if it's there. Something that often catches litigants in person out are the time rules for doing things under these rules. If you have a look at rule 4 you'll see what the basic rule is. An act required by the rules, a practice direction or an order of the tribunal to be done on or by a particular day may be done at any time before midnight on that day. That's the basic rule. However, if you say you did the thing in time, you must be prepared to prove it. So keep a record. The next point to look at is what happens if the time specified ends on a day which isn't a working day. Well the rules specify that the act is done in time if it's done on the next working day available. A working day means any day except Saturday or Sunday, Christmas Day, Good Friday or a bank holiday. So if the time would expire on Saturday and you do the thing by midnight Monday, you do it in time. Various forms of word indicate various methods of time calculation. So if a tribunal tells you that within a, within a certain number of days of or from an event, you don't include the date of the event in the calculation. So suppose a response is due within 28 days of sending of the claim. So if the claim is sent on the 1st of October, you don't count the 1st of October in calculating the 28 days. Another form of wording that's often used, not less than a certain number of days before or after an event. Well again you don't include the date of the event uh, in the calculation. So let's take pre presentations in writing for consideration of a hearing. Suppose you've got a hearing on the 8th of October. Um, these must be presented by the 1st of October uh, as 
at latest because you don't include the date of the event, the hearing, in respect of which the calculation is made. So the presentations must be uh, with the tribunal seven days before the hearing. The tribunal is supposed to assist you, and the rules make this clear. If the tribunal imposes a time limit for doing any act, the last date for compliance shall, wherever practicable, be expressed as a calendar date. So look at what the employment tribunal said in the order or direction or whatever. Time specified by reference to the date when a document is sent by the tribunal is calculated uh, as follows. Unless the contrary is proved, it's the date is deemed as the date endorsed on the document as the date of sending. Now, if there is no such endorsement, the date shown on the accompanying letter uh, will be the date on which the document was sent. The moral is, read all correspondence carefully and diarise these dates. It is possible to extend time for doing things under the rule in most cases. Rule 5 deals with this and essentially it says that the tribunal has a discretion. If you need to apply, do it in writing and explain why it is you need the extension. Don't simply ask for an extension, explain the need. Inevitably you or the other side are likely to fail to observe some of the rules. Rule 6 says that normally this does not render proceedings or a, a step in the proceedings void. What it does mean is that the tribunal can take such steps as it thinks just. Now these steps include waiving or ignoring or letting you off the breach, but can include striking out all or part of the claim or defence barring or restricting a person from participating uh, and awarding costs. There are exceptions where compliance is strict. Presentation of the claim, Rule 8 one, or the response, Rule 16 one, or the employer's contract claim, Rule 23 and 25. And then there are those orders which are known as unless orders. These are orders where the tribunal says if you do not do X, Y or Z then your claim, your defence will stand struck out. And very often they'll use the form of words unless X, Y and Z happens the claim or the response stands struck out. Those are strict and if you don't do what you're supposed to do by the time they tell you to do it in the unless order, then there is nothing else the tribunal needs to do. Automatically the strikeout occurs. So that's a strict provision and that's in Rule 38. And then finally under Rule 39, orders for deposits which require you to pay sums of money. So if you haven't done what you're supposed to do, namely pay the deposit by the date provided, then the consequence is automatic and that is strictly construed. One of the features of the new rules is that um, mediation and alternative dispute resolution are given more prominence. There is a fee for judicial mediation and we'll come on to those in uh, later talks in the series. But under Rule 3 the rules state that wherever practicable and appropriate, the tribunals will encourage the use by the parties of the services of ACAS, judicial or other mediation, or other means of resolving their disputes by agreement. So we've now finished with the general and introductory parts of this introduction to the tribunal rules. We'll now move on to consider preliminary hearings and the interim orders a tribunal can make and from then look at the 
full hearings and what happens after hearings, including costs.